Okay, so um, we've talked a little bit about um, HIIT and Tabata. That's one type of workout, um, but is it important to have like a well-rounded, balanced workout? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, it's important to get several aspects into our workout during a given week, right? So there's our um, aerobic activity, as we just mentioned, VO2 max. Um, there's strength training quite important, especially for women. Um, strength training also builds bone density, by the way. So you may have been diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, or you're concerned about not wanting to develop that. Strength training, AKA weightlifting of some form, it could be your body weight, will help bone build bone density as well. So quite important. Then there's flexibility. You wanna build that into your routine as well, especially helpful for injury prevention. Um, and finally, balance. That's something that people don't think about too often, but your balance, your coordination, is something that starts to degrade over time unless we put in that work. Um, and again, has a lot of bearing uh, with function, especially as we get older, you know, you know, icy roads or unexpectedly, you know, jostled in a crowd or step off a curve, something like that, right? We want it, that feeling of catching ourselves and being secure and knowing where we are in space. And that needs to be developed. Okay, so um, also immune system. That's super important. Uh, can you elaborate on why that's important for exercise, I guess? Yeah, this is an interesting connection. That okay. exercise is quite stimulatory for the immune system. So, um, for example, I'll give you an anecdote. I remember when I was young, I was like 10 years old, feeling kind of, you know, under the weather, had the flu, laying in bed. My dad's like, you should get out and take a walk. I really didn't feel like taking a walk, right? I was tired. I was achy. You know, he's like, you should get out and take a walk. You're going to feel better. It's like, all right, fine, dad. You know, and um, I remember after that walk, Dang, if I did not feel better, you know, um, <laughs> I start feeling a little better. And I learned that, you know, the physiologic reason for that a little bit later on, right? And so it has to do with the circulation of our white blood cells, right? And so as we engage in some moderate exercise, um, the white blood cells sort of get into circulation and start moving and getting where they need to go to fight off that infection. It's called demarginal, uh, demargination of white blood cells. But instead of hanging out sort of on the edges, they're like, fully in circulation and then floating and then going where they need to go. So it actually is stimulatory for the immune system. Also raising your body temperature is stimulating for the immune system too. So for example, naturally you get a fever when you're sick and that's because your immune system functions more efficiently at a higher body temperature. Similarly, if you were to sit in a hot tub or go to a sauna or do a little exercise to just kind of raise your temp, quite a good thing for uh, stimulating your immune system. Interesting, yeah. okay. Um, so, Let's talk about improving your blood glucose. I know nothing about this and why this would be important. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, I've never even, honestly, I've never even heard of blood glucose. So maybe you could even start off talking about that a little bit. Well, sure. Um, blood glucose is a simple sugar that's floating in your blood. Okay, no matter what carb you eat, so, you know, your carbs are typically your bread, starches, things like that. They all get broken down. Um, into several different simple sugars. And the one ultimately that gets utilized by your body is glucose, bottom line. Now, your brain runs almost entirely on glucose. Um, other organs, not so much dependent on it, but it is still crucial throughout uh, you know, your body. In fact, if your blood glucose drops too low, you feel sluggish, you feel queasy, you get sick, um, you, you go into a coma if it gets too low. It's a lethal situation. On the opposite side, if your blood glucose is too high, you have essentially diabetes, right? And that's a problem. That gl glucose circulates and then it reacts uh, chemically in certain ways. It basically creates sludge in your blood vessels. And so you start damaging your blood vessels along the way. My, uh, the importance here of exercise of blood sugar though is that we wanna keep our blood glucose level nice and low. The definition of diabetes is it becomes too high. We want it nice and low. Think about that we want our body to run very efficiently. With little spurts of circulating glucose, we can make good use of it, and there's really not too much circulating at any one time. <clears throat> um, when we exercise, it actually stimulates remodeling in our cells so that they sprout new blood glucose receptors, and that's a cool concept. So if we ask the question, you know, how many blood glucose receptors are sitting on your cell right now, the answer is it depends. And it depends. If you've been exercising, your cell can sprout more, which will then pull blood sugar out of circulation. So that's healthy for anybody, but especially if you've been told that you have diabetes or prediabetes, you're at family risk, um, you can remodel your body in such a way that it will sprout more blood glucose uh, receptors and lower the blood sugar that's circulating. Um, so also, so we're talking about blood glucose and how this is you know, directly affecting your brain. Can we talk, to, talk about brain health a little bit? Because I know we're talking a lot about exercise, but um, no. is there anything that we can do to help in that department, I guess? Yeah, exercise also quite good for the brain. So simply enough, um, 
from the point of view of blood flow, right? Uh, and what we call vasodilation. That is your arteries dilating and delivering blood to any given area. Um, just as we need that for our exercising muscle, we need that for our brain to think clearly, right? So your overall heart and blood vessel health will affect your ability to think clearly. Um, beyond that though, it's quite interesting. There's something called brain derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. This is important to look up and research if you kind of have that predilection. Um, but this is phenomenal. Uh, I basically liken it to miracle grow for the brain. That's the concept, okay? So when, this, when there are levels of BDNF that surge through our brain, it stimulates new nerve growth and development. Um, it enhances connections between nerves, especially in the areas of our brain that have to do with learning. And so it's phenomenal. And so we know that when we exercise, there's a spurt of BDNF that's released afterwards. Um, so exercise being quite helpful. There was a <clears throat> article that I found that was really fascinating. They had people take a random memory test. So faces matched to random names, okay? They showed you maybe 20 different faces, okay? Then group number one just sat on a couch for 20 minutes. Group number two exercised on a little exercise bike moderate intensity for 20 minutes. Then they came back and retested everybody, right? And the exercise group was performing consistently better. And then they drew their blood and they measured BDNF levels. And sure enough, the exercise group had higher BDNF levels. So something as direct as your ability 20 minutes later, remember what you just saw, some name and face, you know, can be enhanced by some exercise in the meantime, which will predictably stimulate BDNF levels in the brain. Okay, and since we're um, talking about brains, <laughs> mindfulness yeah. is also very important too. Could you elaborate on that? Because, you know, we're hearing more and more about mindfulness, but I, you know, I, w I guess I was surprised to see this on uh, the exercise routine. Why do you think that's important? Yeah, because it really supercharges your exercise program to make it effective. That's my concept. Um, I'll share an anecdote. I remember I was reading an article from a Olympic level swimmer who had won a bunch of medals. She was reflecting back on her career and she said her career never really got going till she started focusing and really paying attention to everything she was doing in practice. At that point, her career took off, right? So it's the concept of when you are, let's say in the gym, doing your lifting your weights and stuff, what are you thinking about, right? Are you looking over here? Are you thinking you gotta go check your phone in a minute? Are you thinking about your to-do list after you get out of the gym, right? Or or literally is your the only thought in your mind just, I'm working this muscle right now and you're almost visualizing and feeling at work, right? Or when you're on the treadmill, in your mind, are you just thinking about, you know, my heart's working, my lungs are working, I'm breathing, I'm delivering oxygen. You're like fully present with focus and intention in whatever you're doing. That's the concept. Um, a lot of times mirrors, you know, it, why are there mirrors in gym? It's not just vanity. It's also so you can check your form and be mindful of what you're doing, right? So that's kind of a concept. You know, if you are lifting a weight and you're looking in the mirror and you're seeing exactly your form, you're focused in that moment and it really enhances the, the development of what you're trying to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely want to be focused. Um, and then I see strength, time under tension. So yeah. no idea what that means. <laughs> yeah. So I want to talk about um, strength and then recovery uh, for a second with okay. us. So uh, let's, let's ask the question, how do we build you know, muscular strength? Mm -hmm. There's this key concept called time under tension. Um, and that means that as you're doing your strength training, there's obviously tension you're putting through that muscle. The longer, the more time under tension, the greater the strength gain will be. Now, <clears throat> um, in times past, there had been an idea maybe that you have to work extremely hard, let's say, you know, many sets, many high reps and stuff, and then you get a lot of soreness, and then you take like, you know, several days off. Um, but that's not so good for your body in the long term. You damage the muscle, when you're sore that next day, that's actually muscle damage. If I went in and did a blood test on you, there's levels of oxidative damage to your body. There's levels of inflammation. There's even oxidative damage to your DNA that occurs after heavy exercise like that when you're sore. Okay. Now your body slowly recuperates and then, you know, the logic used to be, well, we tear down the muscle and we damage it, but yeah, but then it comes back stronger, you know, three to four days later, five days later. That is true, but you have damaged yourself in the meantime and your cells and your body are only so resilient. They can only go through that damage process so many times before they stop bouncing back so quickly, right? So what if there were another way to train strength where we never overdid it to the point of getting sore the next day, but we were just kind of consistently getting it in. So instead of, uh, you know, taking five days off because I worked my legs so hard that I could barely walk, what if we did something on the legs every day? And again, that's where the time under tension concept comes in. So you don't have to necessarily go to maximal exercise. You don't have to go to failure. You don't have to go to soreness, but you just get your time under tension to be up in terms of your volume 
and you'll still get to the same endpoint. So when I exercise right now, if I'm sore the next day, I consider that a failure of my program. I overdid it. I'm not interested in creating damage to my muscles, oxidative stress, none of that, right? I try to stay just under my failure, maybe working like, if I could do 10 reps, I'll do seven, but then I'll do that many times and I'll do that multiple times during the week. So then in the end, I'm ending up with the same time under tension and therefore the same strength gains, but I'm not depleting myself um, with, with the time off and the soreness and all that. That's very interesting to me because I think I played division one volleyball yeah. and it was always like work out till you're sore and you can't move. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so that's definitely been driven into my brain. Yeah. Um, and the, I guess the myth was that, you know, your body would just get used to it. Yeah. So, um, what you're telling me though, is it, it's better to come up to be working out more frequently, but maybe not like pushing you yourself to a point where you're extremely sore. You're really needing to recover. Correct. Yes. As regards strength training, think of it like a gymnast. Okay. okay. Gymnast doesn't go, I'm going to train shoulders today. I'm going to kill my shoulders and then take a week off because I can't move my shoulders. I mean, they couldn't do that, right? They're in there every day. They got to do their routines. They got to do the rings. They're going to do some floor exercise. They're going to do this and that. They don't just over focus on one body part, um, but their training's integrated and it's pretty consistent. Every day they're going into practice, you know, and so they're getting that time in really consistently. Um, I think that's kind of the best the image I have in mind. So um, the last two points I wanted to bring up on here were soreness and recovery. You kind of touched on that a little yeah. bit already. So I don't know if there was anything that you wanted to add um, about damage and overuse and maybe if you are feeling that way, like what you should do. Yeah, just the importance of recovery. Thankfully, I think it's become uh, sort of a fad concept in a good way over the last few years. A lot of attention to like recovery. How's my recovery, right? How's my sleep? You know, this and that. Basically, your sleep's got to be on point. You got to get your protein intake up. You know, if you are doing, uh, you know, aerobic endurance type exercises, they would recommend maybe 1.2, 1.4 grams per kilogram body weight of protein in a daily basis. If you're doing heavy strength training, science would say more around 1.6, 1.7. Okay, so your protein intake's up. Um, you would be very helped by um, antioxidant regimen, so your vitamin C, your vitamin E, or more advanced antioxidants like alpha lipoic acid in particular or N-acetylcysteine. These things are quite helpful. Um, also, uh, fish oil, very, very helpful. Very helpful for reducing muscle soreness and enhancing recovery. So about three grams of omega-3 fatty acids. Could be fish oil, could be flaxseed, krill, algae, whatever, but the omega-3 fatty acid is very helpful for recovery. All right, thanks, Doctor. Mm-hmm.